Good afternoon and most welcome to 974. We are uh, energized here. We just had some nice lunch that uh, our lovely patron Naomi Shamsi brought to us. Iranian rice and lamb, I think it was. It was very tasty. Very soft lamb. Today I was thinking of continuing uh, the lead of deconstruction and see how that could help our health and make us uh, more complex in our body and mind. Complexity always equals something stronger, something more working, something more sharp. All intellectual endeavors are complex by nature and fractality. They are never simple. Simplicity always makes for something that does not work, that cannot read off the complexities of the world. And uh, we have a great heritage of a lot of complexities. I mentioned that yesterday when we were speaking about Clark, and he shows on a very simple plane how complexity, complexities grows very, very uh, stepwise and that the child always learns the preposition in and then the preposition into because it takes an, a direction but out of takes a third part it is it's an antonym going on here so we have three things first we have in then we have out and then we have direction that is negative out of This is tedious and boring, but it is important to establish that everything is based on very simple pieces and then it gets more and more complex. So oddly enough, by going into these simple things, we can understand how complex it is. And I was shocked myself, I was actually thinking about this last night, that the complexities is much greater than I have. I ever figured. I thought uh, I thought I could say some sentence and that sort of carried a value somewhere. I don't know where the value was coming from of being good or uh, decisive or clear, something like that. And, and then I started to figure where where would that quality come from? And then I realized it can only come from complexity. Otherwise. We have no way of explaining from where it's coming. And fractality is the only working force in nature, no other. So why would it be that human beings would be the exceptions? Which is something the educational system thinks. They have a model for how smartness, sharpness, working pro uh, propositions work that doesn't really have an explanation. They just say it refers to something, but how it refers and to what it refers is never ever a question for knowledge. That we cannot look into. And I never ever thought about it before. I realized this is actually a question to be asked here. And I might be excused because no one in the history of human mind has ever thought about that. How does something represent? What is the working principle? It's a bit once more uh, the time of Newton when he said uh, in the introduction to Principia, in the pages that follow, I will ponder about this most important subject, that is time. Dear old Newton never ever mentioned time in the whole of Principia. Why is that? He did not have an explanation. So we're living with a sort of 
constant lockedness. Uh, I was thinking on my security uh, cabinet at home. Yesterday I thought to myself, let's open the security cabinet. I haven't done that for a long time. And I'm going to take a really good look. And uh, something really unpleasant came over me when I opened it. I didn't know what it was. But that was before I looked into it. And when I looked into it, I found something I never ever seen in my life, I think anyway. And I assume somewhere deep down in myself, I had a hunch that was something that I couldn't explain really what he was doing there. And it was rather nasty. But the interesting part is not <laughs> that it was nasty. The interesting part was that I knew something was there because I didn't see anything before I opened it and I got the feeling directly. Now that thing is not a bad thing, it's actually valuable, but the problem is more than I can't really explain what it's doing there. Um, how it got there is rather unpleasant and I think maybe it's my bad memory. Uh, so somewhere deep down I possibly know, but that is have to be much deep. There's actually two levels. The level that realized that there's something I can't explain is more conscious. But I, could, I couldn't feel it, but I, I could feel it in my body. But somewhere deep down is the memory of how I got that thing. Must have paid for it rather dearly, I think. Next time I'll show you what it was. A rather interesting thing actually, but it wasn't nice to not know how it got there. It must have been purchased by intention or for some reason. And all those things are sort of hidden for me. I can't reach out to them. But it's the same thing when it goes to Newtonian time for Newton himself. Of course he couldn't explain it even to himself. Do not assume that. If he could, he would have put it into writing, trust me. It was not like he sat there with his per parchment or whatever he was writing on and thought to himself, I don't know what it is, I shouldn't put it on. He, he had no idea. He had sincerely no idea what time should be in his system. So there wasn't even the possibility. So. Most likely he never thought about it at all and he wasn't aware it was no longer in the Principia. Sometimes our mind is very kind to us. It doesn't let us know the things we don't want to know. Things like death and disease, such things. I mentioned in the previous lecture, I think you need to raise that a little bit. Uh, up, up far as you can. No, no need to pause, I just can put the instrument. <clears throat> I was mentioning the strange attractor and the strange attractor actually explains the things I've been mentioning before. The strange attractor explains time, it explains how, what we're referring to and what we want or mean or say or intend uh, are connected. They are connected in the chaotic system by necessity. There are no other systems in the universe, so it's an easy bet. But the second thing is it actually explains, it has some explanatory power to it can actually make us understand that there were a question there from the beginning. And I think somewhere in our live lives we think we can't know that and we give up. And maybe we, got, we, we give up so soon the question doesn't even have time to emerge. So it becomes just a blank. And I think these are the blanks that makes it so hard to get anywhere in our thinking and why uh, our whole culture has come to a halt somewhere. I mentioned earlier 
Paul Feyerabend shows that science has stopped developing to, to a certain degree and that we didn't find the cure for cancer as we were convinced in the late 40s. And that development is, as he says, of dogmatic nature. Now I start thinking maybe it could be explained by a strange attractor, that we have a sort of strange attractor that draws us in the wrong direction, like a heartbeat that is wrong, or a mentality that is not fruitful. A negative mentality, I would say, could be also a strange attractor, although one that is low on the scale. As we learned from Clark, negativity is not the opposite of positive. It's a quite specific thing. And if you translate negativity to the chaotic system, Negativity is like going out of the room. It's leaving something behind you, something you don't know. And what you don't know can, by definition, not be complex, because it's an unknown. And I know there are some friends of mine who claim com complexity can exist outside our consciousness, outside human consciousness even, and outside our universe. I don't agree with that, and you will be very hard to. Uh, it will be a very hard task task to find any mathematician, topologist, uh, physicist of rank that would agree on the idea that there are non-existent complexities. It's a sort of nonsense, to be honest. Have you heard about the ten non-existence existences? Let me go and explain this with another area. I'm going to take medicine today. Medicine could be seen as the idea that the body somehow is absolutely disjunct in comparison to our mind, psyche, soul, spirit, mentality, whatever. And if we are to treat the body, we can use only the information from the body. And that would be a physical body, whatever that means. And as you hear, this presupposes some sort of division here. And this division we mentioned before, that division is actually between two unknown factors. Why are they unknown? Don't we know our own body and don't we know our own mentality, our spirit? I'd say no. Hmm, how can I say that? Where's that coming from? Well, it's the ontic movement. The ontic movement means that we preemptively, before the fact, decide that there is a division, before looking into the stuff. And that division that is before, which is very important, since it's before, it will block, block out all knowledge. Because the properties we get, if I, before I get into this room, say, uh, the things in this room i never seen before in my life, and I have no idea what's inside of it, it should be divided into two groups, group A and group B. Would that be effective? No. Why is that? Because I haven't seen the room yet. And the ontic movement does that very thing. No one ever proposed a division between soul and body. It is something that evolved somehow. But we know nobody said it, nobody proposed it. It just was a sort of forgetting the more important question of why. Why do we have certain things? And that's a more fundamental question. But if you divide something preemptively, uh, it won't work. It will block out knowledge. It's the same as saying, I think all uh, languages uh, in New Guinea should be categorized in two different language groups before you know about it. 
This has actually happened. I have a good example. Uh, I don't remember her name, but she writes travel guides somewhere in the US, and these are very popular. But the odd thing with these travel guides, she had never traveled to the countries, and she never gathered any information on them. So she's just using things that she heard about, and most things that she just makes up. Those books are sold, of course, for comedy reasons. They're really entertaining. And you get a good insight into her mind. But you, would you, my question is, would you gather any information of the country she's describing? She could, but it would be very unlikely. And of course, she wouldn't, she would agree with me. She'd say, of course, I don't know anything about New Guinea or Madagascar. I think one of the most popular uh, was the book she wrote about Nigeria. And she said it was mountainous where a lot of people yodeling. And I think that's very entertaining. But the same thing holds true for the division between soul and body. It's a happenstantial uh, division. It's a random one. It doesn't come from uh, thinking. It doesn't come from a philosopher sitting down and saying, hmm, I think I'm going to propose a hypothesis that there is a division somewhere and I will give the following argument why that division is valid. No, it happened in the same way as, oh yeah, almost in the same way as Newton ended up with time. He made his calculations and all of a sudden this remainder was time, space, and scale. He didn't know what to do with them. They were just there. They were not taken from experience, thinking, empiricism, whatever you want. Of course, he couldn't mention them. They were constructs, in a way. But they made themselves. And the same actually holds true for the division between body and mind. There is there's no sense. You cannot divide those two things. Uh, and this is ex exactly the same thing as I mentioned about language before. You cannot divide language from the world. It would never ever make sense. And Clark showed that very clearly with this expression tall and small. Because tall means different depending on what sort of thing there is in the world. If I would say that Cal is a tall man and he's just two inches, it would make sense. But if I was talking about an ant, would be, it would make perfect sense. It would be a pretty terrible ant that is two inches tall. And uh, Clark starts in a very analytical, philosoph philosophical way. That's why I like this article so much. It doesn't matter. He can start wherever he wants. And of course, he used the lingua of the time, the 70s. Everything was analytical. It didn't matter. We still ended up with a reality in, this, in, 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 in the end. And it's really funny. So the deconstruction sometimes really comes easy. And it's then it is, especially when you do deep thinking, you really ponder the things that you want to understand. And in the same way, I think this gives the idea that the body is ruled by Newtonian law somehow. Gravity, the strong force, the weak force. And starting with that, we get a very fragmented body. We get an idea that the body is completely made of different parts that be, could be treated separately. If you have a pain in your arm, which is very common, you have like a tennis arm or something like that, tennis elbow, that should be treated separated. It should be taken out of its context, this part is bad, like I was an engine or something, take away the bad part. And that ends up with a lot of problems. The body and the soul are not a legit division. They go into each other. You need to treat it as a whole. 
and just by divide the body in these two things soul spirit which we don't really know where it starts and where it ends and the body we have already created a problem and if you create a problem it's a little bit like going out on a journey on a boat and you don't know where you start it's absolutely necessary on the sea that you know where you started otherwise you will have no use for your compass you will have no use for your map you will have you, no use for your sextant. It won't help you. You need to know where you started. Because if you go one, 10 miles that direction and 10 miles that direction, you can count if you know where you started. But in this case, you don't know where you start because the division is arbitrary. <coughs> so when you're actually talking about an arm, it's okay so let, as long as you talk in an ordinary sense. I'm talking about oh, my, my arm is here. And, I have an elbow and so forth. That's okay. But if you really want to treat the elbow and you start using the same reasoning and thinking it's completely separated from what's happening in my head, that's an absurdity. That's not scientific because there is no thing in the scientific world that is absolutely divided. The old notion of, for instance, a ball was that it was consisting of one billion atoms and they had nothing in common. That model is gone and has died, died actually before quantum mechanics, because it doesn't make any sense. Why would you calculate me hitting a ball as 10 billion atoms happen to be in the same place more or less? And, and constituting a ball. No, a ball is actually a separated chaotic system. It is a thing in physics as well. And it acts like one thing. And if I kick it, it's going in a certain direction. And that direction is completely clear from the start. It almost has a will, but the will comes from my kicking. The same is with the human body. How could it make any sense to think that the human body could be like 20 different directions, all pointing in different ways, this way, that way, this way, this way? It doesn't make any sense at all. And we don't care about those questions because they are non-questions. But I think it's time to ask those questions. It doesn't make any sense at all. How could it be that the Milky Way has only one direction? But we should have like 50. And I should have 20 different pills for my legs, for my knees, for my tummy, for my brain, for my kidneys and so forth. And my thinking has nothing to do with it either. How I think is a completely different thing. According to an analytical philosopher, thinking has a, repre has a representation in the outer world. What the outer world is, I don't know. What representation is, I don't know. It doesn't make sense. So we can only come to one conclusion, is that thinking and movement is exactly the same thing. And this is the only thing that has support from neurology. There's no other support from a representationalism, analytic philosophy, or the idea in academia that words can sort of refer to something and you can check them out with epistemology or some dictionary or some giant computer somewhere in the in, the, in Alpha Centauri, some other star. No, uh, the cerebellum, as David Bradl explained, is thinking. There's no thinking outside the cerebellum. And easy movement and easy thinking, precise movement and precise thinking are exactly the same thing. And that is one of the reasons you can train yoga, tai chi, qigong, and you train your mind in a completely literal sense. You become sharper, you become more intellectual, because the only way to train your intellect is through the cerebellum. There's no other way. Once it gets more complex, you've got the complexity that is intelligence. There is no cheating way. You cannot copy uh, the Principia it won't work. It won't give you intelligence. This is actually what Voltaire did. He copied all of Prokipia. 
he rewrote it three times. That did not make him understand it. Actually, his uh, missus, mistress uh, know more about Newt Newtonian physics than Voltaire did in the end. It's really amusing. And she wasn't even an engineer. So there is a problem here. We need to find what is a smart thinking. What was uh, the people having that were smarter in the olden days and appreciated conciertos, architecture, painting, Shakespeare, uh, the canonical works of Western tradition. Where has that gone? Well, of course, it disappeared when the complexities of the cerebrellum disappeared, when our movement capacity disappeared, when our voices started to sound squeaky and shallow, when we were no longer balanced in the universe we have always already been in, when we thought that we could move to a world of representation and that intellectuality for some mad reason could be corresponding very well to the outer world or corresponding in a manner to the outer world that I am going to grade with a big A or something like that or is graded automatically by the big gradient machine in the universe somewhere. No, that doesn't work. Uh, as Gibson said, that is the outtake of the village idiot. Nobody within neurology believes that. And this is actually a good thing. That means that we don't have to check everything out. I was going to add to this lecture a book I found in the library three days ago. Uh, and it was this woman who wrote, how do we know things, especially in these days, where there's so much fake news and so forth. And she said, today it's extremely difficult to know what is true. And we need to look into so many books and we need to do uh, source critical analysis and all that. And the first thing I'm thinking, who can do that? Who has the time for that? And still, how can you be sure? And the second thing I realized, how is she thinking? If you see something, you either understand directly if it's good or you don't. Because there is no referential line between if somebody comes to me and says something, uh, I have to, to see what he, that person, he or she, is saying. That is the only evidence I have. I can't use no, some other method. But the good thing, fractality shows that is the only thing you need. Because that voice, that expression will carry all of reality. Because movement carries everything. A human movement has an infinity of storage capacity and we use it already. It would be impossible not to use it because it's an incredible source of both storage, uh, pretension and retention, all those different things. And it has also to do with into and out of and so forth. This is what we're using already, and this is what they were using in the 16th century, when they still had these thinking capacities. They directly observed something and could tell whether a painting was true or not, or whether something coming from a book was true or not. It shows itself directly. To cite Wittgenstein, you never ever in daily life have to figure out whether some saying is true or not. You know directly, epistemological rules are when you completely lost your uh, control of a language, when you don't even understand what people are saying to you, and when you don't judge people in a positive way, you don't understand if that person is trustworthy or not, and so forth, if that article is trustworthy, or what I see is trustworthy. If I look out of the window, I don't see much. I know instantly I can't trust my eyes because I don't have my glasses or the window is actually, no criticism, Kali, but the window is quite dirty as well. 
it's very hard to see anything out of it and therefore I can't make judgment based on it. I don't need any epistemological theory to tell me that. That, com that comes the same instance I look out of the window. There's no delay. How could uh, the, the, uh, our ancestors survive in the savannah if they had to make epistemological investigations? Whether to tell if an animal is going to be in a certain place at a certain time. Hello, wake up! And you, you analytical philosophers are also implying that you are incredibly much smarter than the hunters of the savannah, even when it comes to catching an animal. That uh, is a complete rot, absurdity. It's not true. I think epistemology uh, usually is a crutch. And you use that crutch when your legs don't work anymore. Where your fractality doesn't have the capacity to reach outward and actually grab a piece of the outsideness and come back with it. Or to be more precise in hermeneutical terms, to meet the otherness and in the difference between the two things we get reality. We don't get reality by copying something outside and looking for sameness. This is actually something that leads to disease, as Ian McGilchrist shows in the second chapter of The Matter of Things, and that, that most schizophrenic don't know whether their thinking is good or bad, which is rather horrible. So it's like, uh, if you have 70,000 thoughts a day, I, I know which ones are better and which are worse. I know that intuitively. But for schizophrenic, they all have the same value. So they get stuck even more in the analytical, philosophical idea of epistemology. So they can't tell whether a thinking is bad or good. And then they are completely lost. And in the end they can't tell what is something they wish for and what is the actual case. And that's, doesn't that sound like an analytical philosopher? Because they often mingle together their own wishes for the world, what it should be, and what the world actually is. And I would say that's one of the really main problems with philosophy today, is that they mix their subjective wants with what actually is the case. That makes for a philosophy that's only good for that person and no one else. I can't use that philosophy. I can imitate it and I get weakened by listening to those things because the strange attraction in my body, my body slash soul, gets weakened with every idea of representationalism. And I would say representationalism never started with an ideology. It's a disease from the start. So representationalism is the symptom. There is an underlying disease where you no longer can tell which thought is good or bad or what impression is good or bad or where you should go and on top of that you think your body goes in like 50 different directions. That is schizophrenia. Uh, I wish I had the whiteboard here but there is a very famous drawing uh, an ex-schizophrenic patient uh, draws how he perceived his disease and it was like everything was fragmented, everything was in pieces. And this is modern age too, to a lesser degree. And he also felt his body to be disjunct and he shows that in that painting. It's like the arm is not connected to the torso, the torso is not connected to the hip, the legs are not in the, in the hip. So there's no connection. And this disconnectedness is the actual body feel of modern humans. And it comes in part from the division that medicine does. And we know medicine has a big problem curing a lot of diseases today.
allergy, asthma, arthrosis, rheumatism, uh, pathological neurologic, neurological pain, as Christopher is suffering from, the herb guy. Uh, he never got any better in the last 10 years. So we're not going to get better either. We are on a descending scale. We have something really weird, especially in the Western world. And it's this idea that old age definitely means a descending scale on bodily function, but also on mental function and knowing factors. So we are as best when we are like 18, 20, and then we digress, then we descend. This is not caused by natural laws. This is caused by us not adhering to the single strange attractor. For every time we think in a representational way, we slope down the sliding curve. Every time we do this division, we lose energy. Every time we think the world is out there, we cause ourselves harm. It's a self-harming thing to do, because it means we take away the complexities of our body and soul. It also means that we are letting our one energy direction go haywire, go somewhere else. And it's a blocking out of knowing capacity. Why is it otherwise that in East Asia you get more balance? This has actually been proven for almost 50 years ago and then proven once more again and again. When you reach an olden age in China, you are more balanced bodily wise than a 20 year old. In the West it's absolutely the opposite. In China, you normally don't lose your posture when you reach 70 or 80. In the West, you lose your posture already when you reach 60, 65. The differences tell that there is a factor that is completely different between the Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere. In the Eastern Hemisphere, you're usually at your peak when you are reaching a very mature age. And the concept in China for advancing in age is a positive one, whereas the Western one suggests indirectly it's a negative scale. It's a scaling down on all things. And in the East, all people are respected for a good reason, because they are incredibly knowledgeable, because there is a lot of knowledge to gain if you, for every day, become less representational and more fractal. That you enter into the exogenous with everything you do in one direction, not 54 or 755. When you think your body and mind is the same thing, you are helping yourself. It's the same like having a house and you think for some mad reason the roof is not part of the house and I won't take care of it. That would mean the ruin of that house. We do the very same thing and we've been known that for a while it's time that information came out to the people because we are suffering 10 times more today of allergy, asthma, arthrosis, rheumatism than we did 60-70 years ago. So it's progressing and we got new stuff that didn't exist 50, time, 50 years ago, almost not. Like repetitive strain injuries, like burnout syndrome, like fibromyalgia, which is completely new, never existed before. It's a torturous state to be in, but it's new, did not exist before, and it doesn't exist in the East. Why is that? This division we make do cause bodily harm and mental harm because it makes thinking impossible. David Bradle said, you can look at even an electroencephalogram and see when their thinking is effective. 
it would be nonsensical to say good thinking had to compare to something where we don't know and it's hard to refer to something. <laughs> I think the most stupid expression of intelligence I ever heard by any professor uh, was from Dov Westerstorm and I said intelligence is when we compare what somebody's saying to a standard and when it goes above that standard it's intelligence but if it's beneath it's not intelligence. Where is that standard? Where would that standard be? And how can you be intelligent if that doesn't translate in better bodily movement and a better health and a better ability to predict the future? According to him, you can be absolutely intelligent and still not make good decisions. Not so in China. This is the reason we were ridiculed when we got there. Uh, I think until now I haven't gotten over this. Now I'm starting to get over it, actually in this very moment. Because I realize now there is a way out of this. I don't have to ex accept intellectual failure. I don't have to accept those uh, eyes and laughter I get to myself. I felt so ashamed. I'll never forget that. And that was the top of the line that we presented in Peking 1993. Top of the line from the Scandinavian countries. The best of the best, and we were laughed at. The reason is we killed off our own knowledge. We say those stupid things like there is a standard above that standard, and that standard is way out in the Milky Way or Alpha Centauri or in some of those transcendental worlds of New Everett. No wonder the Chinese were laughing at us. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It is a disgrace to think those things even. Because true intelligence, as our master in Qigong said, it shows itself in how you act, in your posture, how people perceive you, and how you take yourself about. That made sense. But the other thing by Professor Orwood was with this standard out in the universe that no one could see and an intelligence that only was intelligence according to those laws. <laughs> I'm laughing like the Chinese now. Uh, it's intelligence according to those laws and you, you can be completely unhealthy at the same time. Your health has nothing to do with it because your body is not situated in the world and you're not in your body and your brain has nothing to do with your mind. All these other ridiculous ideas that are really harmful as well. Because there is another coin to this thing and that's the seriousness. Because this actually causes bodily harm, causes diseases. It causes mental degeneration, dementia, Alzheimer, all those things that are particular for the West. <coughs> so even though I have a laughter, there is a serious thing to this. Giving up the intellectual endeavor has a price to pay in the lessening of health, but also in dementia. Early onset dementia is exploding. And I have friends my own age who try to train their brains at that point, and they're already in a state of pre-dementia. By the early age of 58, 59, 60. And that's sad. So really, in another way, it's not a laughing matter. And it's also this horribly painful thing about being in new consciousness every instance, not having an awareness that goes longer than, I think now it's, we're down to 20 seconds, and then we start over. So we can't keep a thought for longer time than 20 seconds. We don't have that strange attractor anymore. Whereas you turn to a country like Taiwan, the normal figure with an adult who's well trained is 30 minutes, no less. 20 seconds in the West, let's give it 40 seconds. I think that was the last take in, in the last century, 1998. 
and in Taiwan, no less than 20, 30, 40 minutes. It's a big difference. And when you're doing some thinking, if you do want to write something, an article, a document, if you can't keep your awareness longer than 20 seconds, that is going to make the whole article go in one way, second way, a third way. It's going to take away the energy because you don't remember your thinking line. <coughs> and I think that's a pretty good description of HDHD or modern academia uh, dysfunction, uh, we call it that too, when you can't keep the thinking line anymore. And neither could, could your professor or the ones listening to you. This is why fractality is so utterly important in showing people there is hope. Because I met so many dissolution people and I actually uh, encourage my own dissolution. Uh, all the professors I've met have given up knowledge and started to just be uh, satirical or drinking heavily, which is very common within academia. Now also using drugs, pills like, uh, for instance, the citadon is very common to use to sort of take away the pain of existence. My former uh, professor in linguistics, not Jens, another one, he used painkillers. And we asked him once after the party, why are you taking those? It must take away a little of the pain I feel. It's horrendous. Because we are living for knowledge. To understand is the human goal. To progress, to expand, to become something more than I was before. And this is what fractality is about. Every living organism Every structure in this universe is getting constantly more complex. And by getting more complex, it also gets more directed. And that's another interesting thing. The Milky Way, to break that one, it will take eons of time. Because it's so big, it has a complexity so advanced. But oddly enough, human complexity beats even the complexity of the Milky Way. And there are several reasons for that. One is our movement pattern is much more complex than the Milky Way. Our bipedal position with our head above our body gives an incredible amount of more possibilities. And this is to be spiritual, having a head on top of the body. That is the spiritual manner. This makes the complexities go to infinity pretty soon. So we have, as human beings, all opportunities to get more advanced. It's much more advanced than this position, which is still pretty complex. But being on top, having the head on top, means I can go so many different ways. And I remind you once more what Clark talked about in Lake of Johnson. Everything is down to embodiment. There you find the most complex abstract thinking. It's always in the body. Uh, and also as Ian McIlkris showed, with 1200 research groups showing that the body's complexity is abstract thinking. And if you are dull in your body, if you're not very precise and not coordinated, you cannot achieve that abstract thinking. You go down to a lower level. And this is what is called knowledge in the East. The ability to have an erect posture, which makes you, every time you do something, you get a little bit more skilled at doing it. You act skillfully and therefore you add skillfulness and it's sort of, sort of like the chaotic organized system it takes in everything and especially if you don't stop it if you don't limit it preemptively by saying there is a division between body and mind or some other preemptive division instead you wait with the division until that very point it should be 
but don't put it in before you enter the room. Or Trägårdsföreningen, if I should go into the House of Palms and I decide the plants inside this House of Palms should be divided into five categories. And I will say that before I enter the place. There is an outside world, but I'm using the word exogenous. And this is the touching ground where my indigenous direction reach out to something very different. And something happens. And this is the reason I mention Clark's very simplistic rules for acquiring language. Because you see, being on top of doesn't adhere to anything. Some things it does, but not all things. You cannot say on top of, an, uh, of a verb, for instance. You can't say underneath a uh, uh, a tree, it doesn't make sense. Uh, tall, as I mentioned, you can use the expression small. And you can't say, well, oh, that's a very small animal when the animal is like 50 feet or something like, like a dinosaur. You see, reality is constantly slipping in. This is a, a rather, I choose Clark mainly because it's a very down to earth way of showing realities entering into our language. Uh, and once more referring to another professor who said, reality doesn't come into my place. It has nothing to do with that. I was the professor of logic and um, it was the same woman who said she never used logic in her life and she didn't plan to do anyway. That's a defeatful attitude. That's giving up. That's saying no knowledge can be had, and you say it before you look into things. So the problem is, oddly enough, uh, not our energy in trying to investigate the world. In some ways, it's not that. It is not lack of enthusiasm. It's not lack of in intention. It is mainly the lack of there was once upon a time a division made. And we need to get into that division and just think about it. Yes. Just think about it a while because once we let intelligence go into that division, we don't need to criticize it, we don't need to take it away. We realize directly it is not necessary. We see through it. Once it's like the veil of illusion. Like they are falling, literally, they are falling like this and it happens in an instant and you realize oh wow, I can actually control my thinking and when I control my thinking I can control my body and then I can make it better or I can make it worse. What would I choose? I would choose to make it constantly, every moment, a little more elegant. I improve my thinking. I improve my skills at being able to project and for every time I project I get a little bit back and then I am developing. I am like a plant that grows and I will, I would actually say we continue to grow for eternity which is this lecture is going to eternity as well but we never stop to grow. There is no end to it. And I will finish off uh, mentioning something from Paul. He said there is no hope because everything has an end. And that he said in a cynical manner that he appreciates. I would say the opposite. There is no cause for that type of depression. Because we will continue to grow for eternity. It, it's not my hope. That's how it is. Use that positive thing because I don't think there is a greater gift to humanity than fractality, to understand fractality in a way. Or deconstruction, which is the same thing. It's an opening up and it's balancing the body I have here. So I can get the energy to talk too much so late, which I did. But I apologize for that. And uh, I think we better round up here. It's going to be a big surprise to see how long this was. But I say thank you very much and I wish you a very pleasant evening. It was 54. Okay.